right now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the world over. He consistently polls in the upper tier of GOP presidential candidates. I sat down this week with Kentucky Senator Rand Paul here in Washington. The Maverick Senator discussed how the U.S. should work to contain ISIS, how his faith affects the way he approaches issues, and would he support a constitutional amendment to protect traditional marriage should he become president. Here's the first of our presidential contenders series and my interview with Rand Paul. I was struck in the book, you talk about your Christianity, Presbyterian. How does that affect the way you approach these issues that you're grappling with and that we all face as a country? Well, I think that uh, I look at everything through a lens of what's right and what's wrong. You know, I do believe in a moral code. It comes from my religion, but it also, uh, you know, is part of who I am, you know, and I think that it's wrong to steal. I think it's wrong to hurt others, but I think it's also wrong to sort of steal from another generation, you know, so for my kids and my grandkids, don't have any grandkids yet, mm -hmm. but I think it's wrong to steal from those generations and spend their money now and leave them with this enormous mm -hmm. debt. And I think that's one thing that I think is immoral about what we do in government. There's a great line in the book. You quote Dostoevsky. And you say, I did not arrive at my Hosanna through childlike faith, but through a fiery furnace of doubt. About what? Well, you know, I uh, came from a science and math kind of background, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm a physician. And as a physician, you end up seeing a lot of things that other people don't ever have to see. And I think a lot of people see, you know, people struggle and people die and uh, terrible things that happen to people. but. Part of the Hippocratic Oath, when they say you're not supposed to reveal things to others, mm -hmm. it's not just about privacy. There are certain aspects of living and dying that most people don't have to look at, and I think they're, they're troubling mm -hmm. and uh, makes it harder to see uh, you know, God's hand in things when you see terrible things happen to people. Up close, yeah. That's, a, that's always a struggle, I'm sure. Uh, you recently introduced a piece of legislation, something called the Life at Conception Act. It invokes the 14th Amendment. To what end? Well, I think the goal is to drive the debate about when life begins. So many people, I think, are flipping about it, really mm -hmm. on both sides. And we end up having people who, you know, and I had this debate with Debbie Wasserman mm -hmm. Schultz over this, when does life begin? You know, I, I'm an ophthalmologist, and so I examine little babies in the neonatal nursery. Sometimes they're only one or two pound babies, and we examine them to try to prevent a, a form of blindness that is treatable with a laser or, in the old days, with a freezing treatment. Mm -hmm. But this one pound baby, once it's born, everybody says, well, that baby has rights. Whether you're liberal or conservative, everybody thinks that the state can intervene to protect anyone from aggressing against that individual. Right. But my question to, to Debbie Wasserman Schultz was, well, what about a seven pound baby a week before birth? Does that baby have any rights? And she said it was completely between their doctor and them. And it's like, well, not if it's alive. So we really mm. should have this debate. And, we get trapped by the other side, the liberals who always want to talk about the very beginning of, of gestation. Right. And I think it's important to talk about and, and make them express their opinion that a, a ba six, mm -hmm. seven, eight pound baby has no rights. Um, but I believe for religious and scientific reasons though that life begins at the beginning. Otherwise, we just keep finding, you know, an, an arbitrary, the yeah, and yeah. we find an arbitrary time. And the thing is, is that I think the other side needs to say why life isn't there in the third trimester. Make them take up the difficult argument mm -hmm. and begin there. But I think, frankly, as science has changed, when I was in medical school, it was very difficult for a 28 to 30 week baby right. to survive. And now it's a 26 week baby or sometimes even a 22 week baby survives. I want to talk about foreign policy, something that you have really distinguished yourself, particularly in this Republican field. Uh, let's talk for a moment about Iraq. Uh, we have Donald Rumsfeld coming out and saying it was unrealistic to try to bring democracy to Iraq, but yet here we are. And the right. president is about to send 400 more people in to train the Iraqi fighters. A wise move? Well, I think it's not a hypothetical question. You know, Jeb Bush was asked the question, knowing what you know now, would right. you go back into Iraq? And I think without question, it's been a disaster. And anybody who has to think twice about saying, gosh, Heck no, I wouldn't go back into Iraq, really hasn't been paying attention. But it's also not a hypothetical question because we have to ask ourselves, was it a good, was it a good decision to topple Hussein? Are we better off now? 
Iraq's in the middle of a civil war. Iraq has become essentially a vassal state to Iran. Iran has no one to stop them now with Hussein gone. There was a counterbalance. Hussein right. was a counterbalance. There's an ongoing civil war. There's then a civil war within a civil war with the Sunni extremists fighting Sunni, but also with the Sunni fighting Shia. Say, been, been but for what a thousand do we do years. there? What do we do on the ground, given that the Christianity has been decimated right. and these minorities are being crushed? Well, see, the first thing you have to realize or ask yourself is the things we have done, have they helped Christians or hurt Christians? So I was against arming the Islamic rebels in Syria. Mm. The Islamic rebels in Syria, the so-called people on our side, have often been the enemies of the Christians. There right. are two million Christians in Syria. If you ask them, who would you prefer, Assad or ISIS? To a person, they'll tell you Assad. They've had an uneasy alliance with Assad for decade after decade. Mm. Is Assad a saint? By no means. But the thing is, is that there's a young man that uh, was written up uh, by the name of Zarkis El Zakam, who was mm -hmm. killed in a little town called Malula. And this is a town where they speak Aramaic, same language that Jesus spoke. And when they came to town, he said, I'm a Christian, and if you must kill me, do it. And they did. But these were the people that were allied with, that's the nicest thing I can say, with the mm -hmm. people who we were arming. And we don't frankly know who got all of our arms. Many of our arms are in the hands of ISIS. Right. And so I think we have to think before we leap. And then I think we've made it worse for Christians by being involved in the Syrian war, really on the opposite side of the Christians. Yeah. Uh, Scott Walker said he would be open to sending more troops into the region. Would a President Paul be open to sending more troops? It would be the very last thing I would do. I think war should be the last resort. And I think uh, really putting uh, hundreds of thousands of troops into Iraq is a mistake. I think in all likelihood, can we win a war? We can win any war. We have the political might to win any war. But there have been some very thoughtful people who have said recently, they have said, well, if you want it more, if the people there want it less than mm -hmm. what you want, there'll never be a lasting victory or a lasting peace. The Iraqi soldiers, if they're unwilling to fight and if they're going to continue to run, we can't want it, the victory more. Can we win Mosul back? Yes, we can win Mosul back, but who's going to hold it? Mosul's a city of 1.5 million Sunnis. Most of the army from Baghdad is Shiite. They're not going to be able to hold Mosul. The people there don't want them. So you have to have Sunnis engaged in this battle. Right. So, so much of winning this battle isn't just political might. It's getting a political solution in Iraq where Sunnis are in the army and feel a part of the government. But for 10 years, we allowed Maliki to make it a sectarian government. The Kurds are good fighters and Sunnis. And I would arm them more. So part of the solution is arming the Kurds. I would frankly promise the Kurds, if they fight for it, it's theirs. Yeah. You know, at the end, I'd let them have a homeland. As president, would you support a plan that you have floated about that you would deny aid to any country that abuses Christians, mistreats them, or Absolutely. allows anti-American sentiment to Absolutely. reign? Absolutely. I think what's most surprising is when I introduced that amendment in the Foreign Relations Committee about six months ago, Almost everybody voted against me, Republican and mm -hmm. Democrat voted against me. But if you ask any American or you ask anybody watching your show, do you think the American taxpayers should give money to countries that put Christians to death or put them in prison for life for interfaith marriage mm -hmm. or changing mm -hmm. their religion? I think most of your viewers would say that's abhorrent and we shouldn't give them a penny. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am. But we have about 25 countries that have laws on their books predominantly Muslim countries, about 25 of them have laws on the books that put Christians to death. There's right. one on death row, Asia Bibi's on death row in Pakistan right now. Hmm. No, it's an outrage. I want to shift gears for a moment, talk about gay marriage. You have a very novel approach to this, um, almost a middle way. You believe the states should make this decision, decide gay marriage, but what do you do if the Supreme Court in a few weeks or a few days says, this is a federal right? What does, a, what does a President Paul do at that point? I think government you know, should try to be as neutral as possible at the federal level. If government gets involved and says it's a constitutional right, mm -hmm. the real problem isn't even so much with marriage, it's what are you going to do with hospitals, with mm -hmm. schools, with churches? If you have a constitutional right, are you going to go to a school and say that a, a Christian church uh, school has to uh, have people that... Um, the church doesn't accept you know, their, their mm -hmm. lifestyle. And mm -hmm. so I think that it's wrong to, uh, have the church, to have the federal government involved in the decision. It's gonna to lead to a great deal of problems. 
When they wrote the original Windsor decision mm -hmm. on gay marriage, Justice Kennedy spent about seven pages saying it's a, historically always been a state decision. Right. And so it'll be going back on everything he said only a, less than a year ago if he tries to mm -hmm. federalize this, because he was saying it was a state decision. Other than that, you cannot discriminate on benefits. Mm -hmm. If it's just on benefits, that's one thing. If it becomes a constitutional right, the debate they had before the Supreme Court really illustrated this, is that church schools, church teachers, church hospitals are going to be told that they have to accept something that's uh, against their doctrine. Uh, Scott Walker has, uh, is on record saying he would support a constitutional amendment should this happen, should marriage be federalized. Would you? Uh, I've always told people I don't want my guns registered in Washington or my marriage. I don't want, mm -hmm. the federal government's never been involved in this. Now, it would be for a constitutional amendment that says that the government can't interfere in religious institutions. It's called the First Amendment, mm -hmm. and we ought to enforce it. Religious liberty is protected under the Constitution. So you have that, and then are you gonna create a new constitutional right that butts up against the First Amendment? Mm -hmm. And that'll be the real question as to how this shakes out. But I'm not for the government uh, coming into the church, absolutely not. I'm not for the government coming into church schools or church hospitals and telling them what to do. And you wouldn't support a gay marriage constitutional amendment that would ban gay marriages as I've never a constitutional really been, Yeah, I've never really been for adjudicating this at the federal level. I think it's actually worse because I think what would happen is we actually wouldn't win that amendment, we'd win the opposite right now because mm -hmm. culture's been going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So my fear is that if you want to make this a national issue, you're going to lose much worse than if you keep it a state issue, you still got about 25 or 30 states in which you probably will still win the issue. Mm -hmm. You had an amazing filibuster a few weeks ago about uh, this whole NSA question of collecting data, and you really ended up containing their ability to collect this data and store it. Here's the question now. What about the backdoor entry, the stuff that they already have? How do we protect that and keep foreign governments as well as our own from getting their hands on that information, private information. I think the best way we do it is we have to acknowledge the way the Fourth Amendment was intended to work. The Fourth Amendment says you can get information. Mm -hmm. So if you think someone's a terrorist, you can get their information. You have to write their name on a warrant. You have to individualize it. So I'm not against the government getting records individually. I'm just against them getting them generally from uh -huh. everyone. So a general warrant or a non-specific warrant was really one of the leading reasons why we fought the revolution. We didn't like British soldiers writing warrants and we didn't like, like them coming indiscriminately into all of our houses. The court has said the president's program was illegal. Congress has now told him it's illegal, but there is still some question whether or not they'll continue doing it. And the reason why there's still a question is there's a serious lack of trust because mm -hmm. the director of national intelligence before this was revealed he basically just lied to Congress and said it didn't even exist. Mm. Two of your competitors in this presidential contest, or soon to be competitors, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, have not spoken about the situation of Disney replacing American workers with foreign workers that they are bringing in. What is your reaction to it? And should that foreign visa policy be amended? I think we need to look very carefully at how many people we need, not only for economic reasons, but for national security reasons. I've been a big uh, supporter of looking at the student visa program, particularly mm -hmm. in having heightened scrutiny from people coming from certain countries that have significant jihadist movements within there. Mm -hmm. We used to have that. It was a special program where we had increased and heightened review of applications to come in the country from certain countries. That I'm for. For economic reasons, I'm not against people coming here. It's just a matter of deciding what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. I also think that it's a twofold problem. We also have uh, almost defeated the work ethic in our country. And so for like picking crops, hard work, if we didn't bring in migrant labor, um, we've, uh, we're rotting from the inside. We have people who really, uh, we've destroyed the ethic of work in so much of our population. But Senator, in this Disney case, these are tech workers, American right. tech workers in their 40s and 50s who are training their replacements over a month. Is that troubling to right. you? Well, yeah, and I think what part of the reason why it's troubling is you have a stagnant or shrinking economy. If you have a growing mm -hmm. economy, it's not as big a problem because there are new mm -hmm. jobs and new opportunities abound. The reason why we have a great deal of trouble is if there's a limited amount of jobs, and the reason you have a limited amount of jobs is we have the highest business or corporate tax in the world, mm -hmm. we have the highest regulatory burden in the world, we have this enormous debt dragging us down. All of that 
makes it so we, such that we have a tenuous economy and then these things mm -hmm. become more uh, paramount. Final question. The Wall Street Journal had a poll recently and they looked at independent voters. You are beating Hillary Clinton by almost 10 points among independents and in the Republican field you're in the very top tier. Why is that happening and why is this establishment in the Republican Party so opposed to a president poll possibility? I think it's one of the extraordinary strengths we have, and that is that if you poll me against Hillary Clinton in the battleground states, the purple mm -hmm. states, right now we're beating in four of them, Colorado, Iowa, Pennsylvania. No one's beaten the Democrats on the Republican side in Pennsylvania in 20 mm -hmm. years. In Why are you breaking election. through? I think it's the liberty issues. It's the issue of privacy, which attracts a lot of young mm -hmm. people. I've been working on criminal justice reform for a long time. I think that the war on drugs has disproportionately put people of color in jail, and I've been taking this message everywhere. I also believe in economic opportunity for those who live in poverty. I've been to the south side of Chicago, I've been to Philadelphia, I've been to Ferguson with a message that I want to bring people up out of poverty by leaving more money in their community and not taking it, sending it to Washington, mm -hmm. running it through the ringers and then giving them a pittance back. I want to leave significant amounts. I would leave billions of dollars in the economy. In Chicago alone, we'd leave over $3 billion in tax cuts in the south side of Chicago. How do you get around this establishment to do it? The GOP establishment, they have been savaging you, <laughs> particularly your foreign policy stance. Yeah, I think I'm the least popular person in Washington right now, but you go outside the Beltway, it's a completely different reaction. We have large crowds in South Carolina, large crowds in New Hampshire, large mm -hmm. crowds in Iowa. They all want to be left alone. There's a huge leave me alone coalition. And it's not just Republican. It's Republicans, it's young people, mm -hmm. it's also independents as well. And I think the polls tell the real story that uh, there really is this movement among independents and that's ultimately how you win elections. Senator Paul, thank you for your time. Thank you.